a wet Friday. Um, seems to have turned, dampened the turnout a little bit, but I imagine people will be coming in dripping a little bit late. Um, uh, we are at the next to last lecture in our series of a sustainable campus. What's being done? What more can we do? Um, and I would like to remind people that we um, have one more meeting on December 4th, which will be our opportunity to do kind of a brainstorming exercise, a mini charrette in which we think of ideas of our own that maybe haven't come up yet or add on to things that have already been mentioned. Uh, we will put uh, base maps up all over the wall, we'll have you all drawing things, and we'll have hopefully a good time generating some ideas. We will have several people, several of our past speakers uh, and people from the sustainability office here to uh, reflect and comment on the ideas that you all come up with and uh, we will give those ideas to them. So this is your opportunity to synthesize and give back um, and maybe put some creative ideas into the hopper for the campus. Um, I do want to remind you also that we do have our only real requirement for this course besides attendance is a five-page double-spaced paper which is due at the beginning of class on Friday, December 4th. Um, so that's two weeks from today. And we are asking you in this to make one specific proposal of your own for making the class, the, the campus more sustainable. Uh, and to refer to a number of the lectures that we, um, this is just for those who are enrolled, of course. I know that many of you are not enrolled, but um, uh, refer to the lectures and uh, add one graphic of your own making that illustrates the concept in some way. It doesn't have to be a fine piece of fine art, um, but just something conceptual can be you know, a bubble diagram or some conceptual graphic, but um, we like to think graphically as well as uh, in written form in this profession. We'd like to communicate in as many different ways as we can, so give it a go. Um, and also, I mentioned last time, those of you interested in the Sustainable Cities tour of Northern Europe that Jeff Lux does every summer, do see him or the uh, Campus Study Abroad office soon to get, get a place in line for that. We are lucky to have with us today uh, Susan McCauley, who's uh, spearheading many efforts at Shields Library to uh, retrofit the library to gain LEED certification. Uh, we will be, I will be working with her in the winter uh, with a class to look at the courtyard area uh, the, and the, maybe some other external environments of the library. Uh, but uh, she is a um, graduate of UC Berkeley uh, and has lived in Davis for about five years. Uh, uh, proof that you can switch careers. We have talked about the backgrounds of some of our speakers. Uh, she had a career in business and now she is in uh, library management. So thank you very much for joining us today, Susan. Thanks, Steve. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you today and talk about sustainability at Shields Library. I apologize, there are two pictures. They're going to cover text, but it shouldn't impact anything when you convert from Microsoft to Word. I've just learned new things today. A typical day. Most people think of Shields Library as pretty much just books, and I'm here to hopefully broaden that thought process for you and let you know how we're working to become more green. And the green movement at Shields Library really started in 2007 when my boss, Helen Henry, arrived. Helen is the acting co-university librarian, and one of her big missions is to turn the library green. I'm going to be talking about all of these areas today, and the biggest area that I'm going to be talking about is the LEED certification. For those of you who don't know what LEED EBOM stands for and who missed Sid England's talk, it's Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, um, and it, the EBOM is the Existing Buildings and Operation. We are lucky to have with us today Chuck McGinn. Thank you, Chuck, for being here. Chuck is with construction or and design management. Did I flip that around? You've got a new group you're well, working in. Well, it's a new name for all of us. Yeah. So it's design and construction. construction management. Management. <laughs> Thank you. Chuck is the lead consultant that I have been working with, and he um, has offered to answer questions at the end if people have them. But we're going to be talking about lead, about recycling, about what Steve touched upon, connecting the courtyard and lighting, and none of this could happen without the likes of the students, faculty, and staff. Shields Energy is a big building. We are actually the biggest building on campus. We are a big energy draw, and we want to do everything we can to become good, better stewards of university resources. I thought before we stepped forward it would be helpful to do a quick history lesson for you. There were five major building phases at Shields Library. 
In 1908, we were one room in the Creamery building. And in 1940, the main library, as we know it, began with the North Wing being added. That's the area with the 24-hour reading room and the main reading room, for those of you who are familiar with the library. And that's actually the wing of the building that I work in. And in doing the math, you'll see that part of the wing building is going to be 70 years old next year. And there are times it really feels and acts like a 70-year-old building, and you'll see how that has presented some challenges to us over time. In 1964, the east wing was added. That's the area over by Olson Hall. When my sister was an undergrad here, that's the area that she came into the library. That was the main entrance during that time frame. In 1967, the south wing was added, and that was fairly quickly followed by the major addition of the west wing, which is the current entrance to the library. And coincidentally, in today's dateline, um, it's announcing the retirement of our university librarian. But it also has a ton of history about the building of shields, if anyone is interested. In 1992, there was a big renovation of the South Wing, and we like to think of 2009 as the era that we began going greener. I also thought it would be helpful to sort of give you a day in the life of Shields Library and what we're all about. We are the largest building on campus, as I mentioned, and we are 400,000 plus square feet. And I can assure you that is a big, big building. We have a lower level and five floors above that. We have over three and a half million volumes in the library that is growing constantly. And we have 3,400 study seats. Now, I know some of you might say that's not enough, particularly during finals. Um, but that is the space we have available for um, student study areas. You'll hear me talk about some library census work that was done last year and as part of that. Chuck and two students monitored attendance at the library to find out where people were. And we found out that on any given day there were about 800 people in the 24-hour reading room, and with them were 519 laptops. We have 168 public workstations, public computers, at the library, and we get um, between seven and 8,000 people on an average basis. But on the first day of class this quarter, which was September 28th, we had 9,288 visitors to the <coughs> library. Now, if you came and went to the library that day, you're counted twice. We do have actual gate counters to help us with that. And overall, we get over 2 million visitors annually to Shields Library. Let me start with LEAD because that has been a huge effort um, on Chuck's part and on the library's part. Again, leadership and energy and environmental design for existing buildings, operation, and maintenance. As part of the University of California sustainability policy, they designated that each campus would identify a building to be certified on campus. And Shields Library was fortunate enough to be selected for that. We kind of wondered, well, why Shields? What, what made us the lucky ones? Um, the criteria is, uh, some of the criteria was that we were over 50,000 square feet, that we were a non-lab or medical building, that we had a single or few departments. And the library is actually, from a campus standpoint, it is one department. But within the library, we have multiple departments. But it makes it fairly easy for communication and drawing resources that we're just one, line, one department within the library. And we have high student involvement. We would not be where we are today if not for all of you. And that really helps us in many ways that you'll hear me talking about. I think with everything, there's good and bad news. And as with anything with the LEED certification, there's some really positive things about it. We are a big building. That, again, you'll see on the other side, we're way greater than 50,000 square feet. We are a single department. That makes it easy to communicate. Chuck and I meet almost weekly regarding LEAD. Chuck can provide me with the work he's been doing, updates, requests for data, and then I'm able to disseminate that throughout the library to get the information he needs. So it's very easy to communicate in that respect. We also have the advantage of having some lighting work done in the library, and you'll hear me talk in much greater detail with that. But the um, metering-based commissioning, which is a partnership with facilities management and PG&E, has done a lot of work that is going to assist us in the LEAD process. We have heavy student usage. Again, about seven to 8,000 students during the quarter on any given day. 
and we have enthusiastic staff and management. As I mentioned, one of my boss's main missions is to get, as she calls it, the lead plaque at the front of the library. Some of the difficulties. We are a huge building, and we have lots of variable occupancy. Those of you who've been by recently, it's midterms. The library is pretty full. It'll taper down a smidge, and then finals week, as you know, it's hard to get a seat sometimes. But come early. The library is not too crowded first thing in the morning. So that is um, one of the challenges. The 24-hour reading room, of course, by nature of the name, is a full-time operation. Lights on all the time. We have three sets of utilities that are work, we are working with, and we have some old equipment, particularly in the north wing. Those, the doors at the north wing are all 70 years old, and some of their locking mechanisms are a little bit of a challenge to keep up to speed. Um, we laughingly sometimes call it the creaky old lady. <laughs> What's involved in the LEED certification? Well, I had no idea when I got involved um, with the sustainability effort at um, Shields Library what LEED was all about. Um, I went the wrong way. I apologize. LEED is a point-based system. Are most of you familiar with LEED? Okay. Um, I have this wonderful book that I drew a lot of information from, and if anyone wants specific information, we have it here. But it's a points-based system with 100 total points available. And the points are in the different areas that I'll talk briefly about. <laughs> but of those 100 points, to become certified, it, you need 40 to 49 points. If you want a silver certification, it's 50 to 59 points. Gold is 60 to 79 points. And platinum, the big kahuna, <coughs> is over 80 points. So my question was sort of, well, how do I get those points? And there are a number of different categories. Water efficiency is one of the categories. Within the categories, you've got pre prerequisites and add-ons. And I'm not going to go into that kind of detail because, quite honestly, I don't have that expertise. But I want to give you a broad overview about some of the different categories. Water usage is water inside and outside the building. It includes irrigation. It includes restrooms. It includes staff break rooms, anything that's related to water falls in there in, the, in that 14 points. One of the bigger categories is energy and atmosphere, and that, by nature of the beast, is hard, harder at shields in some respects. It is 35 points total. Some of the things that are included in the energy and atmosphere category are conducting an energy audit of the building, creating preventive maintenance programs for the equipment developing and building an operating plan. And one of the ones that I think someone could write a thesis on is design, er, basically describing all the mechanical and electrical systems and equipment. And there, I can't even begin to talk, <laughs> I can begin, but I won't. Um, but we have 13 air conditioning units just to start. So there's a lot involved in energy and atmosphere from a Shields library standpoint. The materials and resources are 10 points, and that covers such areas as sustainable purchasing policies. The library already buys recycled paper, but to get more points, we're going to be looking at other purchasing policies for durable goods, for food, expanding our um, existing purchasing policies to move to re um, recycled reclaimed ink cartridges, things like that. And when we have about a little over 200 employees right now. So there is a lot of equipment that that can fall under. Indoor environmental quality is also a very big area. That's really establishing minimum indoor air quality performance to make sure that you patrons are comfortable and healthy while you're in the library. And all of these, these four areas um, fall, in my opinion, under operations and maintenance. And with a big building, you'll hear me say a number of times we have some challenges. Just to give you an example, the janitorial crew comes in after you guys leave at night. So we have cleaning crews in approximately from 1 to 7.30 every night. You'll hear me talk about the lighting that we've been able to change to save some money, but not impact their ability to get the building cleaned up for you on a daily basis. I love detail. For those of you who share that either good or bad trait, this is an example of one of the worksheets that's been put together to determine 
whether Shields Library can get a point for various areas or it's something we just aren't even going to try and do. And the one that particularly caught my eye was the alternate commuting transportation. That's got a really wide range. You can get between 3 and 15 points for that item. And we're going to be surveying patrons next year in 2010 to find out how they got to the library. Did they bike? Did they walk? Did they take the bus? Did they take the car? And that will factor into how many points we have for that one item, which is C4. And there are pages of these to help us determine whether it's feasible to try and accomplish it, or mainly because of the age of the building or the history, not to try it. I had to put in a library blueprint for you, and I know you can't see the detail, but my whole focus here is to let you know that as part of this LEED certification, all the blueprints for the library have been reviewed and in most cases updated. This is actually an irrigation blueprint with the, um, the library's domain white rectangle in the middle with the courtyard and then the exterior irrigation. <coughs> and I think it's interesting because we've learned that not all the, li the blueprints were up to date. And it's just fascinating to see how that process of updating blueprints is occurring. For example, Chuck has been updating blueprints to include all the stacks. The stacks placed in the blueprints help us better able to do some of the indoor environmental quality work related to uh, LEED because we know where people can be in the library because the stacks obviously would preclude them from sitting and studying there. So, Sort of summarizing what's been happening, we have been updating all of the blueprints. In some cases, we have realized that not only were stacks not in the blueprints, but some of the actual drawings were incorrect. We were looking at a fourth floor blueprint, and we realized that an area that was actually outside was shown as inside. So there's also been some updating and correcting of the blueprints in the um, process. And a lot of the work has been done and recorded and tracked based on air conditioning units. So what I've learned is the air conditioning unit, and I'll just throw out a number, it's 1 to 13, might have a certain square footage that it covers on the fourth floor and the third floor, but when you get to the second floor, it's covering a different space. So we've been tracking some of that information by air conditioning unit also. We have created a preliminary point count for lead purposes, and that was completed to determine whether or not it was reasonable to proceed with the process, and it was determined that it is reasonable to keep going at this point. If we had come up with only being able to get 20 points, looking at everything, clearly 20 is not close to 40, so that would have changed things. The library census work, as I mentioned, we spent a lot of time, um, I use the we term very loosely here, because Chuck and a couple of students spent 24 hours in the library one day identifying where people were when they were in the library, <coughs> and at what point in time were they in the library. And that will directly help us to learn how much air needs to go to certain parts of the library, when are people in certain areas of the library, so we can be as efficient as possible. I did have the pleasure of counting chairs and computers in the library. And for any of you who want some exercise on a rainy day and you don't want to go over to the ark, take a stroll around all the floors in the library and you'll, you'll get a good workout, but wear your tennis shoes. But it is a big building. And again, as we counted the chairs and the computers, we did it by air conditioning unit, so we could track, again, the usage within each area. We have been looking for views and ways to harvest daylight, and I've got a picture of some of those. But we've identified a corridor, to give you an example, <coughs> on the first floor of Shields, which is just adjacent to the courtyard. It's got a southern exposure. It gets sunlight all day long. That's an area that's been identified where we can turn off the lights during the daytime. It's not impacting anyone, but it's saving some electricity and certainly some money. One of the more unglamorous parts of the process has been inventory of the restroom features. We have a lot of restrooms at Shields. We have a lot of older restrooms at Shields. And we have been looking at the existing fixtures to determine what can stay, what's efficient, what's not efficient, what might we need to modify as we move forward. So what's coming up? A lot of work. 
Um, lighting phase two, and I'm actually going to go into more detail about some of the historical lighting in a few minutes. But we have some stairwell lighting that's going to be coming up. And that again is trying to be and become as energy efficient as possible by getting the lights to a more economical level. We have more sensors and daylight harvesting coming in. As I mentioned, we've identified corridors. We have a meeting coming up in a couple of weeks. We have a very large open staff area on the fourth floor of Shields facing west. And we believe that that's another area that when we start talking to the people who are working in that area, that we can reduce the lighting but still allow it to be plenty comfortable. Surveys and policies, we're going to be asking people, did you ride, did you walk, did you bus, did you drive, was there some other way you got to the library? And as I mentioned, our purchasing policies are all going to be reviewed. We have um, furniture that we purchase for the library on a fairly regular basis. And I don't know the full depth of the purchasing policy requirements at this point, but I know looking into durable goods is one of the areas that we'll be following up on next year. Our tobacco policy is consistent with campus, but we do have a couple of ashtrays that we need to move a little further away from doors to be fully compliant. And some good news, our cleaning policies, our custodial crew already uses green cleaning products. So we have, we've got one that we can check off the list at this point, which is great. Occupant comfort, you've heard me talk about, <coughs> about studies and surveys and where people are, and we are going to continue to be looking at that. Um, on Tuesday, I believe it was Tuesday, it might have been Wednesday, we had folks from the HVAC unit on campus crawling through parts of the building looking at air handlers, seeing if there were ways we could modify or change air, again, to make it more evenly <coughs> distributed throughout certain areas and also more comfortable. And as I mentioned, we're going to be doing more daylight harvesting as we go forward. Sad as it might sound, recycling at Shields is a rather new concept, and it is a direct result of a student activist. In 2009, the library staff areas and workstations all got what are called the mini bins installed. And I don't know if there's one in here, but for those of you not familiar, it's a, a blue kind of medium-sized garbage can with a latch-on smaller black one, and you put your recycling in the blue and your garbage or any kind of non-recyclable material into the right one. And we also have within the staff areas designated areas to dispose of food. We're trying to keep food out of individual workstations just so we don't attract any unwanted visitors to the library. But this was directly result, a result of a student who sent the picture on the left on the second bullet there. She sent that picture with a very nice but concerned email saying, there is garbage in recycling combined. Why aren't you recycling? What may I do to help? Her email got to me. We forwarded that email to the right people on campus, and within 30 days, we had 150 mini bins installed in the library. The R4 staff was awesome. They came over and met with every department. They taught us what we can recycle, what we can't recycle. They were the ones who came up with the idea of having a compost area in each of the main department areas so we didn't have food at our desk. <coughs> they were awesome. If you ever get a chance to work with them, they're just great. The, that's the good news. The, the less good news is budget cuts have impacted our ability to get more recycling, the, the larger bins, in our public areas. We had hoped to have more from now. We have requested more recycle bins, but they're just not on the horizon. And if any of you are interested in becoming a student activist for this area, I'd love to talk with you. I don't know the math and I don't know the cost, but it just strikes me that with two million visitors, we're sending an awful lot to the landfill, and it strikes me that maybe we could invest in recycle bins and save money in hauling garbage away, but I don't know for sure, and I'll get off my soapbox about that right now. But we have made strides with recycling in the last year. Connecting the courtyard is our multifaceted approach to sustainability, as we call it, inside the library. For any of you who don't know, we do have a fully enclosed courtyard inside of Shields Library. I think most of the students know it's there, but there are an awful lot of staff who are like, you have a courtyard? I didn't know that. 
what we are hoping to do is rejuvenate the courtyard and make it a more sustainable environment. We want to have an, the ability to expand our outreach. We get a lot of young students coming through the library on tours, fourth, fifth graders, and we're hoping we can incorporate some sort of teaching area in the courtyard. We don't have any real, any good teaching spaces inside, so we're hoping maybe we can put some of that outside. And we really want to become more of a core campus destination. I don't see Will Klein here, but Will Klein is um, a student that I was introduced to as part of my ASU CD outreach, outreach. And Will said, oh, you've got to talk to Steve Wheeler. He's really involved in sustainability. And that's how we were able to connect, and Steve has offered to include this as part of his class next quarter, is getting some students to redesign and come up with some new designs for the courtyard. We're assuming that those are going to incorporate some lead initiatives with drip irrigation, with native plants, with drought tolerant plants, and please get rid of the sprinklers if any of you are going to be in that class. <laughs> we also see this as very much an interdisciplinary effort. Um, we have, some of you may have seen some of the mosaics on campus that the Art and Science Fusion team has done. There's some over at Robbins Hall, there's some at the Arboretum. And we have met with them and they're very interested in what we're calling perhaps literary based mosaics. Uh, something that can bring color and whimsy to the courtyard. Right now it's pretty green and gray, so there's room for some improvement. But the biggest improvement is really creating a more sustainable environment. We won't be able and can't do this without folks like you, without the students who are interested in this kind of work. It's very much an interdisciplinary work. We've already spoken to grounds, to maintenance, to the Office of Resource Management and Planning. We've talked to the Arboretum, so there are a lot of synergies at work here, which is really, really encouraging. And again, we're hoping to incorporate some unusual things. Steve was asking, would the roof be available? And I don't think the roof will be available because we have all of our air handlers up there, but we're really looking for creative ideas and excited about it. And I don't know if it's coincidence or not, but when I was in our special collections earlier this week, I was asking for the blueprints of the courtyard. And they said, oh, they're right by the door. Coincidentally, three people have asked for those this week. So I don't know what's in the air, but there's, there's some interest going on in the courtyard, which is great. Uh, we talked about student involvement. It won't happen without it. We don't think there are going to be a lot of limitations, but we know the main oak tree, for those of you who have been to the courtyard, is a priority, that we do need to preserve that. But beyond that, who knows? Sustainable environment really also ties into the campus objectives as far as their development. We are in the core of campus. Shields Library is kind of an anchor in the core of campus. And we really see the sustainable courtyard as expanding that piece of the campus philosophy, which is getting people to different areas, in our case, the core of campus. I've mentioned the interdisciplinary effect and how that just expands the possibilities. And the location for teaching and community outreach is, is really important to us. When Steve and I were meeting a couple of weeks ago to start talking about this in more detail, Steve had a brilliant idea. Can I share your tour idea? He said, what if as part of this, we could come up with a tour of 10 green things in the library? I'm like, oh yeah. That's a great idea. So again, lots of synergy. It's a great idea. I want them to do it. If they don't, we will. So again, just some really exciting things <coughs> happening. And in these tough times, we are hoping that we can also incorporate some fundraising activity in there where we can put in benches or tables that people can use or bricks or pavers to commemorate occasions and events. So we've got, um, again, a multifaceted approach to the courtyard. I mentioned saving electricity and cutting down. I had never heard of the word daylight harvesting before I got involved at the library. But these are two examples among many that we're looking at at the library for ways that we can turn down the lights during the daylight hours and save additional energy. The top left picture, for those of you who may not be familiar with it, is our Nellie Branch reading room up on the second floor. It's on the second floor northeast corner. 
and then the right side is what I refer to as the mezzanine. It's that area between the first floor and the lower level, looking out on the courtyard. So these are just a couple of examples where we think we'll be able to save some additional energy. I want to spend a few minutes sharing with you some of the work that's already been <coughs> done at the library, which is contributing to lowering energy usage and lowering energy costs. We talked about the NBCX, the Metering Based Commission, that partnership with UC Davis Facilities Management and PG&E. And they, what they did is they evaluated all the mechanical systems at Shields Library way back in 2007. And they then took initial or, or baseline measurements <coughs> of those systems. Systems were then upgraded and calibrated so that they would reach their maximum efficiency. And what I thought was really cool is that they were installed and did install um, computerized and remote <coughs> digital monitoring and controls. And finally, they took the after measurements. Has, has all of the recalibration and the measurement resulted in savings. And in fact, for these three projects in 2007, we've generated over $143 annually in savings. The heating project was to correct the air temperature controls, and that saved, again, about $45,000. <coughs> the air conditioning project was to improve excuse me, the cold air temperature settings, and that was a savings of $60,000. And the electrical piece, which was optimizing the airflow, saved $38,000. So that work was all completed in 2007, and we continue to see the benefit and the result of that. What's even more exciting is last year and into this year, we had three more projects. The three projects were really, to me, they were behind the scenes, but really impactful, and particularly impactful with the $71,000 in savings. <laughs> But to give you an idea of what, what is scheduling the air hand, schedule the air handlers off at night mean? Well, historically, our air handlers have run 24 hours a day because, as I mentioned, the building is used 24 hours a day because our cleaning crew comes in overnight. What we were able to do was take 10 of the air handlers and shut them down for five hours a day. Now, I know that doesn't seem like a big deal, but in the big scheme of things, it did save a lot of money. What's interesting is there were two handling units, or air handlers, that couldn't be worked on. One of them couldn't change, it was an older system. And we run into that occasionally, where there are just no parts or no replacements for what's already in existence. The second one, the second air handler that couldn't be changed was for our special collections. Our special collections have very, very specific cooling requirements to keep to preserve the material. And we have all kinds of alarms and sensors that go off if anything happens to that piece of the air handling. So even with those 10 units, we were able to turn them off for five hours a night. We also installed, which many of you may be familiar with if you've been over to the library lately, in the stacks we've installed sensors. That is throughout all five floors of the building. So in the stacks right now, what you have is some ambient lighting on all the time. When you walk into the stacks, the lights are going to come on. They're going to stay on for about two to five minutes. Now, if you fall asleep in the stacks and you don't move, you're going to wake up in the dark. But I guarantee you, when you jolt yourself awake, the lights are going to come on and you'll say, oh, I'm in the stacks. <laughs> so that saved a lot, a lot of money. And it's funny, if you walk through the stacks, you can trigger them if you, know, you have that kind of thing going. I see somebody, it's kind of fun to race through it and look at Can I beat the lights? <laughs> um, the other area that, around lighting that we did, and this again is impacting and because of our janitorial crew, we started a project, and this project will continue um, into next year, where we were installing lighting controls for the main lighting circuits. And in, in layman's turn, what that means is we have divided up portions of the floors into sections and put light sensors on those. So when the janitors are cleaning in one section of the building, the lights will go on for 30 minutes when they're in there working. If they stay for more than 30 minutes, the lights will re-trigger and stay on another 30 minutes. When they leave that area, the lights will go off. 
the lawn and the land that we're working in, and so on and so forth. What that has helped us is turning out lights in the building overnight. Historically, many, many of the lights, too many of the lights, were on 24 hours a day. So these three examples, coupled with the example from the page before, have saved $215,000 annually. We're really proud of that. We can't take any credit for the work that was done because that is all of our colleagues in other departments on campus, but we're very happy to be contributing to that energy savings. And as I mentioned, we can't do it without all of you, without your interest, without your help, without your support. And we invite you to join us as we become more sustainable. I wanted to close with a couple of things. One is, if you think that there's something you'd never in a million years imagine you'd be doing decades after you graduate, throw that thought away. I spent 30 years in the corporate world, and here I am a year into Shields Library doing things I never imagined. So don't get hung up on, I'm only going to do this, that's it. Because when you branch into areas that you're not familiar with, you're going to learn a ton, and you get to meet really fun people and do things that are just really creative and different. To me, sustainability is very interdisciplinary. We've talked about the different areas in the courtyard. When we talk about lighting, we've got HVAC, we've got heating, we've got facilities management, we've got the physical plan. Tons of different groups involved. It's very collaborative. You work with teams to get things done and you are interacting with people who have expertise way beyond anything you might have, but you learn something every day. It's very inclusive. In my own opinion, it's very, very important. It's a lot of hard work, but you guys are used to hard work. It's what you do. But it's also really fun. So if it's something that you have interest in, we welcome your interest and involvement. And under the reading room, it says contact us. And what I've included is my contact information, and Chuck was nice enough to um, let me include him also. Again, Chuck is our lead consultant. I call him our lead guru. Um, but I will, I'm happy to answer any questions, and um, thank you <coughs> for letting me be here today. We have about 10 minutes for questions. Uh, would you like to add anything first, Chuck? Or, uh... Well, I think Susan did a pretty comprehensive job on it. You know, my role at the university is in uh, basically physical plant, which now has a new name, design and construction management, as things are shifting on campus. Um, <coughs> I probably talk for about as long as Susan did. But there's a couple of things about the Leeds program. I had an image while I was listening to Susan of one of those astronomical photographs of different galaxies colliding, you know, they're all the stars and they're all sort of moving in slow motion. Well, this galaxy, one of them is the UC maintenance system and the other one is the LEADS program requirements. It's not that you're being asked to do something a certain way, it's not only that, but we already have a way of doing it and it's a different way. And aligning those things between this hundred-year-old bureaucracy and these new upstarts that think they know everything better than we do, and sometimes they do, really, uh, that's, that's part of the job, is figuring out how to align that stuff and get you know, the plumbers to do something that they traditionally have not done, for instance. And uh, the amount of documentation and bureaucracy, and I guess the other thing I do is any of you have any sense of uh, mechanics, I'd say that there's a future in building maintenance for college graduates because this business of energy efficiency and high-tech systems that are going in, they're more than the average plumber or maintenance guy knows how to do. I mean, not only does LEEDS require a very high level of energy efficiency, but those can only be met with the latest technology, which requires schooling and education, and I would say ultimately a college degree, to, to manage those systems and do it the way LEEDS wants you to. 
Every time you work on a system, you're supposed to document it. And if you're used to doing it with a pencil and paper on a little clipboard that's mounted to the machine about when you were there and what you did, that's not good enough anymore. You have to have a laptop. And you have to know how to use it. And you have to know how to plug that laptop into automated diagnostic software that goes with each one of these units. So there's a lot there. It's a challenging field, and I don't think it's really been identified yet, but Leeds is creating that field. And so any of you that have hands-on interest, you know, that may be there for you when you're ready to ready for employment. So Susan gave my phone number there, and uh, any of you that have more detailed questions about the LEAD certification and the EBOM program, you're welcome to contact me and I'll give you the, the five minute summary of any of that business that Susan presented. So I hope at one day to be issuing applications for student um, interns, but we don't, we're not quite there yet, but stay tuned. We will need paid student help on the library. So, thank you. Okay, questions for either Susan or Chuck? Um, I know you talked about how budget cuts and how you can't get more recycling bins, but where are you getting the money for all these lead upgrades? We are fortunate that the library is not paying for those. That's being paid for by campus. Chuck, do you have anything to add to that? You've heard the term unfunded mandate. <laughs> That's where a legal body suddenly says everybody has to paint their car blue. You know, they they want you to do it, but they don't give you the money to do it. <laughs> and so the upper management of the University of California has said that every campus shall certify one building as a Leeds existing building compliant building. So the money is coming from various sources scraped up on campus to, to try and assess what it takes and then to reach the certification. So there is no stream of money except where it overlaps <coughs> energy conservation. The campus is highly motivated to do projects that produce savings. So there are separate streams of money and some, sometimes uh, supported by PG&E as a program to help us do energy conservation. So some of those that we do in the library are funded from that source. Things like ratifying the smoking policy is not. That's something that's put on the staff to do. Okay, other questions? Yeah. Well, it's not specific to the library, but I work in a um, slightly off-campus uh, facility. I've been trying very hard to get some kind of motion detectors put in for the lights there. And um, it's six little temporary buildings and four little 1920s originally homes type things. And I keep, and they, and they all have like one light switch per building or two. And it's ridiculous, you know, but how do you get, how, who do you talk to, to try, or is it just not worth it, you know, financially to get these kinds of um, upgrades? Is that a campus location? It's yeah, the Center for Child and Family Studies, it's right off, it's on First Street. Mm -hmm. Well, why don't you contact me about it? I, I mean, if there are energy conservation aspects of it, that you could conceivably be put on a list for, for modification. Other questions? Let me uh, let me follow up on the budget question. One common problem that institutions run into is that capital budgets, that is the money up front to build things, is are separate from operating and maintenance budgets. So even though you're saving seventy thousand a year downstream on something, you can't have any of that to actually put the device in units from. Yes. We do indeed. Wouldn't we love to spend $200,000 on more books for the library? Absolutely. It's not our money to have. Um, it, again, it's savings, so it's reducing money. But our challenge with LEAD, and Chuck touched on it a little bit, it's taking a lot of staff time. That's the good news. We're helping to get it accomplished. But it's, it's a balancing act. You know, when do you spend time doing this, doing that? We're all doing more for less. So. It is challenging times. Okay. 
Anybody else have anything for either of our, our guests? It's getting late in the, in the quarter, I can tell. I it's, it's a, a rainy Friday. Days. Expressions yeah. out there. Rainy Friday, it doesn't get much worse. Than yeah. yeah. Thank you all okay, so well, much. Thank you for, for joining us. Thank Let's you.